All right, so welcome to Women in Leadership. My name is Reagan Jackson, and I'm the Program Director for Young Women Empowered, otherwise known as YWE. We are a nonprofit based in Seattle, Washington, and our mission is to cultivate the power of diverse young women to be creative leaders and courageous change makers through transformative programs within a collaborative intergenerational community of belonging. Um, due to COVID-19, Governor Inslee has asked us to stay at home and with everything closed, many of my youth have been asking how they can still be leaders in our community. So to answer that, I wanted to host this mini series to highlight some local women who are really out here doing cool work. So with us here today, we have Sarah Yinling Post. Uh, Sarah is a mentor with uh, Young Women Empowered at, through our Youth Leadership Council. She is also a part of COVID-19 Mutual Aid, which is a group of activists who've joined together to, to support one another. She was raised biculturally between Hong Kong and Pennsylvania and moving to the West Coast in 2010 to study biology, counseling, and eventually nursing. She never thought she would be working in a huge hospital and especially not during a pandemic, but here we are. Um, and as she enters her second year on the pediatric burn unit at Harborview, she's thinking about how to amplify and support other frontline workers, especially historically marginalized workers, and especially uh, through horizontal mutual aid. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you, Reagan. Honored to be here. Oh, so how did you first decide to go into healthcare? So I thought a lot about this question because I've been asked it a lot. But um, when I thought about it more, I realized that what really got me into healthcare was in my second year of college when a friend wrote me into this project called Night Owls. It was just an independent project that she started, but we got a lot of school funding for it. Um, and we basically went around in buddy pairs on campus between 10 p.m., 3 a.m., and we had snacks, we had first aid kits, and we were just there to kind of check in on people, make sure everyone was okay, make sure they were hydrated, make sure they got help if they needed it. And even though it was a really small um, project, really small harm reduction project, it was super impactful. Um, Cause I think I've always been an introvert and um, I realized that it was just a really good fit for me to be able to go into settings, be clear headed, be able to triage, be able to offer something. Um, and I realized also that when you present yourself as somebody who is willing to listen without judgment, without any threat or fear of enforcement or punishment, people really come to you. Um, and so that opened up this whole world for me of being able to witness vulnerability and resilience in others through care work. Um, and so I worked that job throughout college and then after work, I worked in crisis clinics, I worked in youth homeless shelters, and then um, just basically in order to skill up, not really because ever had medical, you know, um, interest before that, I decided to go into nursing so I could combine some medical skills with this desire to, to be with people in those moments. Well, what, what's it like working at Harborview right now? It's really interesting because there has been a lot of support from the community for nurses right now, including in Seattle. Um, and it's been really great and I really appreciate it. And at the same time, I feel like right at this moment, we're in this calm before the storm. Um, and so things have not hit what they're calling, you know, a peak. We actually had a prediction from the chief nursing officer yesterday that April 17th, I don't really know how they calculate these things, is going to be this peak. Um, when we're going to see a lot of COVID-19 patients. Mm -hmm. But right now, um, all elective procedures have been canceled. A lot of discharges have been sped up. We've opened up new units to care for patients and upstaffed them all with plenty of nurses. So there's this very eerie, um, very stressful, honestly, uh, time of waiting. And then the patients that are there are ones that really have to be there. So when I go to work and I just work three days, I'm caring for people who are really, really sick um, and really injured. Um, Apart from that, you know, across the country right now, nurses, including at Harborview, are super concerned. I'm sure you've heard about having adequate gear to keep ourselves safe and our patients alive. And then even when we do have the gear, uh, which we've been practicing putting on and off, sometimes you need to use it. I've had to use it. And it's called donning and doffing. It's like these super clunky body suits. Mm -hmm. um, and so it feels really hard to connect with patients um, meaningfully while wearing, you know, a mask and a gown and gloves and just all of this stuff. And so I'm really struggling lately to find grace in the system that it doesn't really know what it's doing. I mean, we, I think hospital administrators, nurses, everyone, are just kind of playing it day by day. Um, and I think we're all just wishing there were easier answers um, than there are right now. Well, how has COVID-19 impacted your life personally? 
Um, well, actually, I think it was about a month ago at this point. So before Seattle really was shown like, okay, this is a hub for COVID, I got really sick and it was kind of exactly what I'd been hearing about COVID-19, just this awful cough, these body aches. Um, and so I was sent home from work with a cough, which got a lot worse. I got tested and it turned out I was negative, at least that's what the test said. But that experience and just being home from work when I wanted to be working um, really impacted my mental health. And I felt all kinds of guilt and shame that I was, it was very hard for me to place. Um, I think I felt a lot of shame as, you know, a Chinese person when there was a lot of this anti-Chinese sentiment, kind of especially towards the beginning um, of the COVID-19 talk. And um, yeah, it, it just really was a, it really opened my eyes to um, how difficult it is to be um, in these healthcare settings um, right now. But the really interesting or cool thing about that experience is that I began to use that time and that's continued to connect with other healthcare workers and other nurses. And I've wanted to build these networks of nurses for a long time, especially nurses who are thinking about healthcare through these anti-racist, anti-capitalist lenses. Um, I wanted to do that since I started nursing. And so in the past week, I've really been able to connect with other nurses and that's been very positive. Wow. Well, tell us a bit more about the COVID-19 mutual aid group? Mm -hmm. um, well, it's a group. It actually started, I think it was just an idea that came out of a meeting um, during a meeting that was part of another organization called Parasol. It's a Pacific Rim Solidarity Network. Um, we had been talking um, with folks in China who were um, in quarantine and trying to gain, you know, a lot of insight from what they were going through. And then out of that, we thought about how we could support people in Seattle once COVID-19 hit here. Um, and so pretty quickly a group formed to make a request form for people who need help and a volunteer form. And so I think that's been circulated very widely, much more than um, people anticipated that it would be. And so people can sign up if they need groceries and other people can volunteer to deliver them. And then there's a fundraiser as well. And so that's kind of the principle of mutual aid is that we're helping each other. We're trying to find solutions that don't rely on, you know, big state funding, even nonprofit funding, just people helping each other, people who have resources or skills, helping those who might um, want them without any judgment of whether they truly need them or not, nothing like that. Um, and then through that work, um, there's also been other groups formed within the mutual aid group. So I'm part of the uh, worker solidarity group. And so we're really thinking about how to use this moment to support workers um, when their bosses are denying them benefits, pay, protection at work. We also just in the last few days have been talking about making kits, um, home kits of home, homemade san hand sanitizer, masks, kind of information about COVID, herbs, little care packets so we can give out to warehouse workers, especially who've been asking for them. Um, and also then at the same time throughout all this work, um, I really like how it's grounded in values that have, you know, are very important to the organizers and are not being compromised through this work. Um, and so I think a lot of people in the group have done a lot of thinking and reading um, about occupational health in the past um, and mutual aid and are kind of sticking to those values throughout this. Gosh, I just, I love how responsive that is to, to this moment. Um, I'm wondering too, because to me, like that, that's what leadership looks like in, in a time of crisis. But do you consider yourself to be a leader and why or why not? Um, I think I'm, I would consider myself to be a leader in training still, um, because I think I'm very good at facilitating connections between people. I'm good at thinking up projects. Um, I'm, I think I'm, I've been good at when, um, there's a project that can be accomplished in a small group, um, kind of thinking of an idea for us to get it done without relying on a lot of big resources. And I think I'm good at thinking through situations and listening. I respect all those qualities in leaders, but I think that I also really struggle, um, as many people do as a leader and speaking up and having confidence and really um, being able to teach others and having confidence to do so. And just huge shout out to Young Women Empowered because I really have um, been inspired by the leadership styles of others. A lot of the youth, I'm just like, wow, they you know, have such strong, um, confident leadership that I really admire. And then I think also for 
all of us, um, but right now I'm in a place of trying to figure out how to not be intimidated by the leadership styles of others. Um, mm. Like having the initiative to just start something immediately when the moment calls for it. I'm not sure that I'm quite there yet, but I also know that I have other skills that are really valuable for something like a mutual aid group. And I'm trying to uniquely find my own and be confident in it without, um, yeah, being intimidated that I'm not good enough like or or able to do what other people are doing hmm. i love it though start start where you are and do what you can yeah yeah and don't try to be someone you're not is kind of what i'm trying to aim for these days that's beautiful well what have you accomplished so far well i feel like you kind of answered that a bit but but what are your goals in terms of systemic change at this time oh my gosh i think i like I kind of touched on with, um, at least personally for myself, connecting with other nurses um, who share my values and share some identities, I really want to see more of that, you know, citywide or worldwide as people being able to connect and find each other and help each other. Um, people who, it's kind of ironic because we're all very isolated in this quarantine, but I think I've also seen a lot of connection um, between people that maybe wasn't there before because I, I think and I'm seeing that in these times of crisis, people are really coming together um, to support one another. Well, how can the community support you? Well, you know, I see, thanks Reagan. <laughs> uh, I thought a lot about this and it's, I'm not sure I'll answer it quite right, but I see a lot of support on social media that comes from this place of really thanking frontline workers, thanking grocery store workers and nurses and totally appreciate it. I really feel it. Um, but I also want community to support us in a way or thank us in a way that indicates a longer dedication and commitment to systemic change. Um, like I, I'm grateful for all the support to specifically hospital workers, but in the long run, I want to see more community health initiatives so people don't have to go to the hospital, obviously want universal health care, you know, want um, people to be able to have protection all the time, not have to fight for it when it's most needed want equitable pay for custodians, that kind of thing. So I hope, I, I wonder if that makes sense that um, I hope community, and I know a lot of people are doing this, um, aren't just thanking us, thanking frontline workers when it's hard, but really are thinking about how to create more conditions of equity in the long run um, so we don't have these conditions in the future. Yeah, I, I think that's hopefully one of our, our big goals is not necessarily to go back to normal, yeah, totally. I love that. You know, there is no going back to normal. I've, I've been really appreciating that sentiment. Yeah, let's go go back into a new normal that, that is more equitable and, and more just and, and more responsive to, to the needs of many. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you so that. much for your time, Sarah. Is there any yes. other thoughts you want to share with our young people or? Nope, just keep um, reaching out to each other. Don't feel too isolated. And if you do know that there's this huge community of why we and much, much more beyond that um, to support you in exactly who you are. Thank you. Uh, you've been watching uh, Women in Leadership. Uh, if you want to see more, tune in on Tuesdays to YWE's YouTube channel and you'll be hearing more from from incredible people in our community. Thank you again, Sarah. Thank you, Reagan. Thank you so much.